Always College Football with Greg McElroy is presented by AT&T 5G. Too much college football is never too much with AT&T 5G. Hello and welcome in. We come to you today with heavy hearts. We're extremely disappointed and moved by the passing of Mike Leach. It was announced on Tuesday morning that he had passed away on Monday night, surrounded by family and friends. And we are all just so heartbroken about the tragic news of him being gone too soon at the age of 61. We're going to spend some time telling some stories today about Coach Leach. I was fortunate enough to have interacted with him since the time I was about 15 years old. He recruited me. I was committed to Texas Tech, and we had developed a long relationship prior to me moving into the broadcast world where I got to know him in a little different way. But Coach Leach was always a unique person and one that will always be remembered for having turned around three separate places. If you look at the success that he had as a coach at three separate places, places. Take out the first year at Texas Tech, the first year at Washington State, and the first year at Mississippi State. Remove those from the equation because those would be what we consider to be transition years, if you will. Do you realize that that basically accounts to 18 years as a head coach at the highest levels of college football? Well, in 16 of those 18 years, he had a winning season. This guy was a phenomenal, phenomenal coach. He was an innovator. He was a pioneer. And bringing the air raid style of attack into the forefront at the highest levels of football has impacted the game in so many ways. And obviously his coaching tree, which we'll get to in a moment is for the most part unprecedented with some of the success that's been had by using variations of this attack. So we're going to talk an awful lot about Mike Leach today, his legacy, what he means to me and tell some stories uh, that I've been able to (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> compile over the years, whether it be as a recruit, as an analyst, or as a guy that had just been around college football for quite some time. Then we're going to move and try to update you a little bit on what's going on with the transfer portal. A lot of guys being named, a lot of guys that are entering in, movement starting to happen here in the transfer portal world. So we're going to get into that. And then finally, we're going to tell you about a Power 5 coaching void that has finally been filled. So we'll get to all that here on a Wednesday edition of Always College Football. All right, we come to you today with heavy hearts as the passing of Mike Leach has impacted the entire college football world. And frankly, it's been really neat to kind of look out into the Twitter sphere or into the the social media world, video tributes. It's really been cool to seeing just how many people he touched throughout the course of his career. And and frankly, um, I don't think, and I've said this before, I'm not sure there are many coaches in college football that have had a bigger impact on college football in the last 20 years than Mike Leach. If you just look at his coaching tree in and of itself, his legacy will live on through those that he touched in the coaching world, Dave Aranda, Neil Brown, Sonny Cumbie, Sonny Dykes, Josh Heupel, uh, Dana Holgerson, Cliff Kingsbury, Seth Luttrell, Lincoln Riley, Ken Wilson, uh, Alex Grinch, great defensive coordinator. The amount of guys that came from that coaching tree is truly phenomenal. You might honestly think about the fact that it's all exclusively offensive-minded people. That's not the case. Ruffin McNeil, Alex Grinch, Ken Wilson, Dave Aranda just referenced a few that came up on the defensive side. So Mike Leach was not exclusive to just offensive-minded football. He had a lot of great coaches under him that coached on the defensive side as well. On a personal note, this one hits home uh, big time. Uh, This one is impactful to me Because there are a few. Now, I never played for Mike Leach. Uh, I did not get the opportunity to go into the building and see him on a daily basis. Um, And I will never make anything about me when it comes to situations like this and and heartbreaking situations like this at that. Um, But Mike Leach was the first coach that really recruited me. Uh, He was the first coach that that really came and, and said, hey, Greg, you, you can play. Uh, if you don't know my story, I, I only played one year in high school. I, I was a backup quarterback, both as a sophomore and as a junior. And really to think about 
back then. That was back in 2005 or so. And he was the first coach that extended me an offer at a, at a big time school. And that school was Texas Tech. And I honestly credit him in a lot of ways for giving me the confidence to believe in myself. Because at that point, as a high school backup, I'm sitting there wondering to myself, am I good enough? Can I play at the next level? Is it worth trying to play at the next level? And it wasn't until Mike Leach extended an offer that I really started to believe that I could do it. So I will always be indebted to him because he gave me the confidence to be able to pursue my dream of becoming a college football player. So I'm so eternally grateful for him. But some other amazing stories about Mike Leach that come to mind when thinking about his legacy. Uh, There's no denying that Mike Leach is a unique soul. Mike Leach does things his way. And if you don't like the way he does it, he doesn't care. And I think there's something that can be applied for all of us in while respecting and appreciating other people's opinion of you, ultimately, as long as you believe in yourself, that's really all that matters. And that's what I've learned from Mike Leach. He would not deviate from what he believed in. And I think there's something that we should all appreciate about that and something that perhaps maybe we can all apply in that regard as well. But I can remember a couple of instances. And I know, look, a lot of people have personal anecdotes. I have several. Um, (laughs) One in particular, when I called Mike Leach to tell him that I was going to decommit from Texas Tech uh, and that I was going to be going to Alabama. He he responded quickly like he can do. <laughs> Better. He's so quick-witted. He was so incredibly fast and sharp. He responded by saying, oh, that'll be good. You'll, you'll throw five times a game. <laughs> and of course, at that point, Alabama definitely didn't prioritize throwing the football. Texas Tech did. They said, well, we're going to at least know that we're going to throw it more on the first drive than you will in the game. Uh, and then sure enough, because Mike Leach never forgets, the first time I saw him in this line of work as a broadcaster, we called a game of his when Washington State went to USC and played on a Friday night. Gardner Minshew was the quarterback. This was in 2018. And they were having a great year. Everything was going really well at that point. And Washington State was going to be a problem. You could just tell they were going to be a problem for everyone in the Pac-12. And I remember before the game, I was really excited to see him because I hadn't seen him or talked to him in quite a while. And he completely ignored me uh, and said nothing to me in the hours leading up to kick. And then when I saw him, I said, Hey coach, it's so good to see you, man. Greg McElroy goes, Oh, Hey, nice to meet you, Greg. Totally pretended to have not remembered one second of our interaction for years and years and years as a, as a a recruit and as a one-time commitment to Texas tech. And then Dave Nickel, uh, who was his slot receivers coach at Washington state and God rest his soul as well. Dave Nickel, we lost him at the way too early age of 45. Um, he came over to me a little bit later. He said, did, did coach give you the, I'd never met you before bit. And I said, yeah, he goes, yeah. <laughs> so you, you tried to mess with me a little bit, um, in that regard, but the guy just never forgets. And then the next time I saw him, he said, well, at least you can find solace in knowing that you might've won a championship, but we threw it more times in one game than you did in a season. Uh, so we, we had that constant banter going for quite a while. But of course, most will remember Coach Leach for what happened on the field. And there were two specific moments that stood out to me that helped exemplify who he was. Uh, Mike Leach in 2004, I went to this game as a recruit, so I remember it vividly. Uh, It was my junior year in 2004, and we went to SMU to watch Texas Tech play. Sonny Cumbie was the quarterback. He was the the starting quarterback that year. He had backed up both Cliff Kingsbury and then B.J. Simmons in the two years prior. So Sonny Cumbie was finally getting a chance to make his first start. We were all very excited because uh, Sonny Cumbie was a guy that we had met at Texas Tech camp, you know, a couple years earlier. And it's like, oh, I love Sonny. Like, what a cool dude. Like, so we were all very excited. So we got and put our red and black on and we went to SMU Stadium and we're watching the game really wasn't that great. Uh, 
Texas Tech in the second half, after what was a pretty sloppy start, pulled away. And they were up 27-13 or so with about three minutes left, and Texas Tech gets the ball back. Well, at that point, three minutes left, up a couple touchdowns. Most coaches would say, hey, we're going to run it out, hand it to the back, and let's just get out of here. It was a good, hard-fought victory on the road in the season opener. But Mike Leach proceeded to throw it over and over and over again, right down the field, throw it, throw it, throw it, throw it. I mean, like, absolutely no regard whatsoever for clock management, no regard for potentially giving off the perception of him running the score up. He didn't care. He said, I'm going to run my offense. This is what I do. And after the game, Phil Bennett was the head coach of SMU. And he came out and he took great offense to Mike Leach throwing it in the end zone with 30 seconds left uh, when the game was clearly completely out of reach. But Mike Leach didn't care, completely unfazed. And he said in the post-game press conference, hey, that's what we do. We don't take knees. We don't run the ball. We're going to throw it. That's how we run our offense. And it's your job to stop it. And that, I thought, summed up who he was. And then fast forward to 2018, back in that year, what was a great year for the Washington State program. Gardner Minshew and company, they were playing in the Alamo Bowl against Iowa State. Brock Purdy and Matt Campbell. It was a great game, back and forth game. Washington State had a lead 28-20. Brock Purdy scores. They don't get the two-point conversion, so they have to get it, kick it off, and and hopefully get it back uh, within a couple minutes so that they can potentially go down and kick a game-winning field goal. Well, Mike Leach, with about three minutes and 51 seconds left up 28, 26, you would think, Hey, lean on it. No timeouts left for Iowa state. So lean on it, hand it off, milk the clock, right? Just milk the clock. Just kind of see it tick on down. Every single coaching rule in the rule book says you run the ball, you get conservative, you try to play the clock. Well, Mike Leach comes out on first and 10 first drive pass complete to uh, D. Martin from Gardner Minshew, second down. He throws a fade down the right sideline, extremely low percentage, catches it. Everyone else would be running the football, playing slow. Instead, Mike Leach is not just throwing the football, but throwing low percentage passes down the field. And I'm sitting there on the air calling the game thinking, I can't believe he's throwing the ball. <laughs> like That is crazy. But ultimately, get a couple completions. Next thing you know, they put the game on ice and they end it, of course, with a their first one of the few runs they had at the end. And that was a kneel down by Gardner Minshew there at the very end. So Mike Leach, I think he did things his way and he had a certain way of doing things. And what I will always remember and will always apply to my life here in the future is that there are more than one ways to skin a cat. And even if you are different, even if you see things differently, even if you have maybe a different approach to something that everyone seems to know. For instance, football. Everyone seems to think this is how you do things at the end of game situation. You don't have to necessarily do it that way. You can do it the way that works for you. And I think that can be applied in so many different facets of life. And I will always appreciate Mike Leach for teaching us that lesson even though he was on the football field and applied it in football ways, I will be able to use that lesson and apply it to my life in the many, many years, hopefully, to come. So gone too soon at the age of 61, but his impact and legacy will always be forever felt. He was an incredible coach. He was an incredible person. And he was a person, too, that could find common ground with just about everyone. It didn't matter if you were a billionaire living next to him in Key West or a guy that he would see at Little Dewey's there in Starkville, Mississippi. He could find common ground with you. He could engage with you. And in some ways, you'd find yourself looking at the clock saying, Coach, I got to go. <laughs> because he was so engaged and so willing to talk to anybody. And he could find something that he could relate to you with, regardless of what your interests may be. So gone too soon at the age of 61. Our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. Uh, he left behind four beautiful children and his wife. Um, and he, of course, leaves behind a, a lot of people that were personally impacted and impacted from a distance on the way he went about his business as a football coach for the last 30 plus years. So we love you, coach. We appreciate you, coach. Please rest in peace.
This episode is brought to you by AT&T, official sponsor of the college football playoff. Is checking your team stats at 2 a.m., watching highlights while eating with buddies, or catching the game during a wedding all too much? Nope, because too much college football is never too much. And AT&T 5G keeps you connected all season long. 5G requires compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See at slash 5G for you for details. Now it's time for Let's Talk About It, presented by at and 5G. We figured we'd take a moment here at the midway point of the week to try to update you a little bit on what's going on as it pertains to the transfer portal. A couple of big names that have re-entered the portal. Now, talking a little bit about Grayson McCall, the quarterback from Coastal Carolina. A lot of people thought he might be going to the NFL. Not the case. He is going to be going and leaving Coastal Carolina. His name is in the portal as of right now, and I can't really blame him. You got to think he'll have an endless supply of suitors, but will he end up ultimately at liberty with his former coach, Jamie Chadwell, who took that job just a couple days ago? So going to be very interesting, I think, to evaluate Grayson McCall and where he might ultimately end up in the portal. I think another good possible option would be at NC State. Uh, Obviously, you look at a bunch of other places. He's there in the Carolina section of the country. The ACC lost a ton of firepower at quarterback, so it would make some sense if he wanted to try his hand at the highest levels of football, it would make some sense that he would maybe look in the direction of one of those ACC schools. We also noticed that Emory Jones has entered the transfer portal yet again. Remember, he was at one point the starting quarterback of the Florida Gators. Well, he transferred to Arizona State last year where he won the job in the preseason, but he couldn't hang on to the job throughout the course of the season. He is a good player and an adequate option. However, I don't know if there's going to be a ton of suitors at this point at the Power 5 level. He's a good quality player. He's a first-class human being, and he's a great teammate. You talk to anybody that's been around Emory, they will all echo that sentiment. But at this point, has it been a little bit too much for him uh, at the Power 5 level? Does he potentially have to go down? I'm not necessarily saying FCS, but I could potentially see him ending up somewhere, perhaps maybe at uh, you know a group of five spot that wants to throw it around and and maybe, just maybe, a good spot for him would be USF. Yes, Gary Bohannon's there, but USF, Alex Golish comes down from Tennessee, going to be implementing that hypo offense where they push the ball down the field. Emory Jones is from the state of Florida. USF would make some sense, I think, if they wanted to kind of invigorate a little life and get some name recognition at the quarterback spot. Maybe that's a spot that he would consider. Couple other news and notes. Jaheim Bell, formerly of South Carolina, at the moment, he is committed to Florida State. This is a great pickup for Mike Norvell and his staff. The reason why Jaheim Bell, if you look at Florida State's tight end room, not a great group. They're fine, they're okay, but they're not a great group. Well, Jaheim Bell is probably looking at the way that they use specific players that they brought in in the portal last year and look at just how much better their receiving core was as a result of those portal additions. And Jaheim Bell's probably looking at it saying, man, I want to be the next guy in line like Johnny Wilson was this past year. Now, Jaheim Bell's not necessarily Johnny Wilson. He's more of an H-back, but his versatility is extremely interesting. You can move him around. You can line him up even at traditional running back. He played traditional running back at times last year for South Carolina. So this is a massive, massive addition, I think, for Florida State, especially when you think of the creativity that Mike Norvell likes to use and implement in his offensive system. Another couple names that have made decisions, they're both going to Oregon. Wide receiver Treshawn Holden from Alabama, he's going to be transferring to Oregon. Had moments in the last couple years in Tuscaloosa where you think, man, this guy is about to become an every down dude. But for whatever reason, the consistency just wasn't there. But he's got great hands. He's got great catch radius. He has good length. Maybe not crazy top end speed, but is a very reliable pass catcher that'll be on the perimeter there for whoever the quarterback is in Eugene. That wasn't the only guy that they added. They also added Justin Jacobs, who's a linebacker going to be transferring there as well. So Oregon going to continue to be a big time player as it relates to 
the transfer portal. One other name that you need to maybe keep an eye on, Ladarius Henderson. You're going to say, who the heck is Ladarius Henderson? Understandable. If you're not dialed in in the Pac-12 offensive line trenches, I can understand why you might not know who that is. Fair enough, but he's one of the best interior offensive linemen on the board this year in the transfer portal circuit. He has three years of eligibility left, and he just committed to the Michigan Wolverines. Why is this significant? Well, what happened last year when Michigan went out and added a piece in the transfer portal? Olu Oluwatimi went on as the transfer, grad transfer from Virginia. He's now the center at Michigan, and he anchors what might be the best offensive line in the country. He was rewarded with the Remington Award, the nation's best center. He was also awarded with the Outland Trophy, the nation's best offensive lineman or defensive lineman, basically the big guy Heisman. So the last time they went and prioritized and went out and got an interior offensive lineman in the portal, he became arguably the best offensive lineman in college football. So maybe, just maybe, Ladarius Henderson, now with three years of eligibility remaining, maybe he can become the next guy in line for the Michigan Wolverines there along the interior. Oklahoma's been busy in the portal. We'll add and kind of update you with what they've added, a couple of key pieces along the defensive front. Desan McCullough is transferring from Indiana to Oklahoma, and then Jacob Lacey is transferring from Notre Dame to Oklahoma to two potentially impactful defensive lineman there for the Oklahoma Sooners. And boy, do they need it. Brent Venables needs that presence in the front seven. We'll break down those guys a little bit more here in the days and weeks to come when we get around signing day. That's when we're really going to have a chance to dive into some of the guys that have already made their intentions known as it relates to where they're going, as it relates to what they've done, as it relates to how they improve the standing of the school that they've chosen. Finally, want to tell you a little bit about the move that was made by the Purdue Boilermakers. Purdue Boilermakers. Is that maybe that's is that how we're saying it now? Perhaps maybe I'll just we'll just continue to call it how about the Boilermakers, all right, instead of the Boilermakers. Either way, Purdue has officially hired their next head coach and man, this is a good one. This is a great one. Ryan Walters, the defensive coordinator from Illinois is next in line to become the head coach of the Purdue Boilermakers. 36 years old, but the last two years, he's done a terrific job with the Fighting Illini, especially in the front defensively, man. They have done a great, great job. Now, he replaces, obviously, Jeff Brom, so a very different style here from Purdue. They go from all offense with Jeff Brom to now prioritizing a young defensive coordinator with great ties to the Big Ten, with a great understanding of what the Big Ten looks like, especially the last couple of years, that has done a terrific job in leading Illinois' defense. Remember, Illinois' defense was number one in several key statistical categories this fall, and he is a guy that has really stood out every opportunity that I've had a chance to meet with him. He was not only being pursued by Purdue, by the way. He was a finalist. If Deion Sanders had turned down Colorado, he would likely have gotten the Colorado job as well. So he is a guy that has been very, very successful in his early tenure, only 36 years old, early tenure as a head coach. I think it's very exciting to see what he may be able to do there at Purdue. And hopefully they can continue the great success on offense as the defense continues to improve. But a big hire there for Purdue by bringing in Ryan Walters, formerly the defensive coordinator of Illinois. Let's Talk About It is brought to you by AT&T 5G. Too much college football is never too much with AT&T 5G. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and the fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. All right, it's time to turn our attention to the mailbag, and we so appreciate you guys sending in your questions to our social media at always CFB. That's on Instagram and Twitter. And you can also send it to our email address at always college football at gmail.com. So we really appreciate that. 
Coops, let's kick it off. All right. First one comes from Trey in Georgia. Do you think UGA will be really active in the portal or do you think they'll rely on their depth? See, I don't think UGA, uh, Georgia to me doesn't seem like a team that is going to want to get into the portal world. Like they've already done a great job recruiting. They have a great process in place as it relates to developing players. So, and we've seen this year, I mean, they had a lot of holes on last year, holes, I guess, relatively speaking. They had a lot of key departures, right? So it would have been very easy for them to go to the portal and say, hey, we need a guy here. We need some more depth here. We need to go and get this here. They resisted that urge. So based on what I've seen up to this point, man, I don't get the sense that Kirby Smart believes if there's a rare instance, sure, there might be a guy or two that they could potentially add to fortify their depth at a one particular spot. Sure. I mean, you're never going to turn down the opportunity to maybe improve your roster and create a little bit more competition within the roster. But ultimately, man, with the with how they've recruited and how their avoidance of the portal has been benefited here at times the last couple of years... Uh, I get the sense that they're going to be very, very picky if they go in that direction. So I don't anticipate them being a huge player at all. Okay. Next one is from DT in Mississippi. If I'm DJU, I'm looking to go to a QB friendly system, Tennessee, Arizona state with coach Kenny or Auburn with Hugh freeze. Where do you think would be the best fit? You know, I, th- I think QB friendly systems accurate, but the good news is I think most systems are quarterback friendly nowadays. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that there's many where like it's really, really difficult on the guy. Uh, so I think that he'll likely land in a position where he's going to be successful. No matter what, I just think it's going to be very important for him to get a fresh start. Um obviously distance himself from Clemson. It just got a little bit poisonous there. Not Clemson's fault, not DJ's fault, just for whatever reason, the marriage wasn't working. So time to get a fresh start, time to look elsewhere. Um, Obviously, if if I'm looking at it, Arizona State makes a ton of sense. Uh, I think that could be a place where you could go and you look at the growth that Bo Nix experienced this year prior to his injury down the stretch. So Kenny Dillingham clearly has a good track record of developing some guys. Uh, you got to think that, yeah, Tennessee would be amazing, uh, assuming they would be willing to bring him in. I just, I'm not sure that that's going to be, that's going to make a ton of sense uh, if you're Tennessee because of what you've already done from a recruiting standpoint. Probably don't want to bring in a guy that might be a little up and down. And then some other spots that I would be interested in if I were DJ Uyunglele. I'd be interested in Florida. That, to me, makes a ton of sense. Billy Napier has had success developing quarterbacks in the past. It'd be a fresh start. It'd be against top-tier top, top competition, and you get a chance to compete for a starting job. But you have two true freshmen that are both five-star guys that you're going to be competing against, so that would be difficult. Miami would be another spot that I would strongly consider. Uh, granted, you look at what they had going into last year, and it didn't go well. Um, obviously, Van Dyke is still there at the moment. Garcia is still there at the moment. So adding your, I guess, opportunities there would make some sense. And then I don't think there's any shame in going down. Like if I'm looking at the bigger picture and DJ Uyunglele wants to play on Sundays, I would imagine, why not go to a place like SMU? Look at what Rhett Lashley did with Tanner Mordecai and the numbers they were able to compile. Like that would be a very nice destination if I were strongly considering an opportunity to kind of press the reset button on my career. Houston with Dana Holgerson would be another place that I would strongly consider. So I know that those aren't necessarily... Well, Houston will be, but I know SMU is not considered, quote, power five, but still a very quarterback-friendly offense where you can put up a bunch of numbers and kind of regain some faith in what you are trying to become down the road. Interesting. I can't imagine DJ dropping down, but we'll see. Next one's Drew in Virginia. Do you guys think Brent Pry will take any leaps in year two or setbacks after a three and eight season with the highlight win being over Hugh Freeze in Lynchburg? Do you think the recruiting will pick up under the new regime? Well, you would ha- you would hope, right? I mean, if you look at uh, Brent Pry and and just where they start, I mean, the roster, frankly, was not good this year. Um, so it's almost a little bit difficult to get a quality gauge on where the program's at relative to where the program's going. They've already proven already by going into the portal and, and try to attract some key pieces. They've already gone out 
and have tried to to bring a couple guys in that could potentially become immediate impact guys. So um, and they've succeeded in some ways, landing the receiver from Old Dominion. Uh, so they've they've already kind of been very active in the portal. So I anticipate that continuing. But ultimately, man, this is not going to be a, a quick fix. This is going to take a couple of years. Um, and in order for them to kind of break through and see the daylight on the other side, you might have to get worse before you get better and maybe go young this year with a lot of young players go and offer high school recruits the opportunity to come in and play early. And then we're going to develop you and hopefully grow with you. And then three or four years from now, you'll be able to compete for a conference championship. That would be the approach that I would go with. Uh, Bring it. There's so many good players in your backyard. That would be the best approach. But ultimately, man, are the fans in Blacksburg going to be patient enough to see that plan through? Probably not. So you're going to have to add a couple pieces in the portal for that immediate we need to win right now type of approach. So I think it's a tricky spot. And it's one of those places I do not have a good gauge on right now whatsoever. Uh, I, I don't feel at this point, hopefully here as we continue to dive in, there will be some more information and maybe a little bit more about what the process is looking like for Virginia Tech. But at this point, man, we're kind of grasping at straws. I want to see how they fare. Let's have this conversation in two weeks. Two weeks we'll be able to have a better understanding of who they are really in one week, because guess what? A week from today is signing day. Let's see how many guys they sign. Let's see how many guys at that point, a week from now are considering them in the portal. So we're going to learn a little bit more. Obviously this is the first time head coach. This is the first time at an opportunity like this. So for us to really tell you exactly what it's going to look like is would be kind of grasping at straw. So let's give it a little time and hopefully we can identify what their priorities are in the next week or so. All right, final thought here, and we're going to go back to our discussion about Mike Leach. And obviously, we've talked about a couple stories. We've talked about his coaching tree. We've talked about his acumen. Um, We've talked about how he does it his own way and is unapologetic about doing what he believes. I think all that's great. But I think another thing too... It'd be impossible to completely sum up his impact on college football. Some of the tendency breakers that he used, the shallow cross concepts, the mesh concepts, the man beaters, the bubble screens, the corner routes, the slot fades, the red zone passing game, all the things that they used successfully at Kentucky and at Oklahoma, at Texas Tech, at Washington State, at Mississippi State, all the things that he used successfully have found their way out into the college football world. Like they revolutionized so much as far as the XO is concerned. That system brought so many answers. And it's honestly, it's impossible to defend because there's a guy open on every play. Just the quarterback has to make the right decision and the receiver has to make the right adjustment. But there should be a guy open on every play. And it's been proven true over the course of the last two decades. And then finally, though, We've talked a little bit about how that offense has progressed. Well, it was never going to work at the highest level of football. Well, it worked, obviously, at Mississippi State. They won a lot of games in the years that he was at Mississippi State. We've even seen now one of his protégés, Cliff Kingsbury, take and apply parts of that offense to the NFL. We see air raid concepts being run in the NFL. People said it never happened. Well, it has because it's worked its way up. And sure, that's great. But I think what's most important, though, is it's actually worked its way down. And people say, well, yeah, but don't you want the, the offense and the philosophies to make their way to call, from college to the NFL? Sure, yeah, but how about making its way from college to high school? And now, if you look at, especially where I'm from in Dallas, Texas, if you look at how many high schools are running some variation of air raid That will be a lasting legacy because most people that are consuming this content, most people that watch football on the weekend, whether it be Friday nights in high school, Saturdays with college or Sundays with the NFL, most people's understanding of football, it stops at the high school level. Like That's when most people's careers come to an end. So their understanding of football maxes at high school. Well, the offense that is most prevalent where I live and the where I lived and we grew up is some variation of air raid. So we all learned the game in some ways 
through the lens that is the air raid system. And that system was created by both Hal Mummy and Mike Leach. So to me, that impact and the knowledge and understanding that we have of football scattered throughout the country, it's amazing to me just how many of us learned that air raid system and how many of us learned football in a way that this is how you beat this particular coverage, this is how you beat this particular play. We learned it because we learned the air raid. And that's, I think, a pretty cool legacy to leave. So we love you, Coach. Like we said earlier, rest in peace. Gone at the way too early age of 61. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Always very grateful for you. Always very appreciative of the time that we have together. And know that we'll have opportunities down the road to continue to celebrate Coach Leach's legacy. And we'll continue to celebrate the sport that we love so much. We will preview some games later on in the week. And we will continue to talk about some of the games coming up here in bowl season. That'll do it for Mark Kubiak, Jack Foster, Jack Trail. I'm Greg McElroy. We so appreciate the time that you spent with us today. Remember, it's always college football brought to you by AT&T 5G. Too much college football is never too much with AT&T 5G. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.